Good morning and welcome to Singapore. I see many of you who I think are from overseas. And can I just get a show of hands? How many of you are here for the first time in Singapore? All right, good. I'm glad there's not that many because even those of you who are not Singaporean should have been here before. Now, I just want to make a couple of points which I hope will be food for thought. You know, great fortunes will be made or lost and at moments of inflection. And our world is going through several inflection points, even as we speak. Um, I know we don't want to use too many figures, but there is one other number which I should add, and that's 400. 400 parts per million. Probably sometime in the last one or two weeks, the world's carbon dioxide level, atmospheric carbon dioxide level, reached 400 parts per million. And you should ask, when did the world last have carbon dioxide in the atmosphere at 400 parts per million? And again, that number is you've got to go back somewhere between 2 to even 5 million years ago. Then the next question will be, 2 million years ago, when carbon dioxide was at the same level as it is today, what was the temperature like? And it was much, much warmer, even warmer. I mean, I know Singapore is warm, but believe me, <laughs> it was warmer. Then the next question, what do you think the sea level was like two million years ago at this level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? And again, it's hard to be precise, but the estimates range from somewhere between 10 to 20 meters higher than where it is. Now, to put you in context, you are sitting on chairs in a building built on reclaimed land. What that means is this was underwater 40 years ago, but more importantly, at this level of atmosphere, all the land that we've reclaimed, indeed the entire, not the entire island, but I would say probably about a third of our island would be below water. So that just gives you an idea that anyone who denies the existence of climate change, anyone who says this is not going to happen and this is all academic hocus-pocus designed in such a way that some of you in this room are going to make fortunes, uh, is sadly mistaken. So that's the first thing. The next inflection point is human beings. And human beings haven't been around for three million years. Our existence as a species is much shorter than that. But for the first time in human history, <clears throat> we now have seven billion of us. And that's not just it. More than half of all human beings now live in cities. This has never happened before. The next inflection point is that the age of cheap natural resources, which could be literally just scraped off the ground, whether you wanted coal or iron and all the other minerals. I think those of you in the business will know, yes, there will be cycles and there will be ups and downs. But I think at a secular level, the age of cheap resources are coming to an end. The next point, the fourth inflection point, if you look in the case of Singapore, more than half our water is imported. Increasingly, the solution for Singapore is the use of reverse osmosis to either desalinate water or to recycle used water. Today, as we speak, our desalination capacity would be about 10%. For reverse osmosis for recycling, would be about 30%. But if you go to 2061, which is the day that our agreement with Malaysia ends, 30% will be desalination, 50% will be recycled. Now, what this means is that we may have, or we may think we have solved the water challenge, but you realize, any one of you in the business will realize, what this means is that we are now in the age that energy equals water. Because with reverse osmosis, as long as they've got energy source and I'm willing to pay for that energy, I can generate as much water as I need. But this only emphasizes the point that there is a very tight and increasingly tight nexus 
between water, food and energy. So those of you who are looking for a crisis will know that there will be a crisis somewhere in this nexus. In fact, there are likely to be several crises, and, the, and each crisis also then presents an, a market opportunity. And so these are the four inflection points which I wanted to leave with you to suggest that great fortunes are going to be made or lost, and it's probably sooner rather than later. Now, before I go, I wanted to spend a little bit more time to, to give you a, a, some perspective into how the Singapore government approaches this thing. Singapore is a small, barren rock. But on this barren rock, we've got five million people. And we've got to make a living. We've got to make enough money so that everything we need, food, water, clothes, resources, services, everything we've got to buy from the world market. Our vision is for Singapore to be a climate resilient global city that's well positioned for green growth. A working example, a proof of concept that there is a virtuous cycle between environmental sustainability and economic development. That is not a trade-off, but a virtuous cycle. And that there will be many opportunities for companies, both local and global, to create value from the businesses in this context. Now, this sort of word sound, you know, sounds plausible, sounds attractive. But the reason why I submit, I hope you will believe me when I say this, is we do this because we have no choice. If we had lots of resources, lots of natural resources, if we were not a low-lying island, if we had lots and lots of land, if our people could simply just live and wait for grass to grow and crops to, to be harvested, we wouldn't have to do all these things. But a small, barren, low-lying island, when we say we need to be climate resilient, it's real. When we say we need to be a global city to open, to serve, people and companies from all over the world, it's real. We have no other choice. When we say that there's a virtuous cycle between environmental sustainability and business, let me give you an example, a real life example. Some of our competitor cities in the world don't have blue skies. They have pollution in the air. It is a key reason why many people move their children and their families to Singapore. And the way the world is going now, you know, in the past, you could attract companies by offering cheap land, low taxes, security, hardworking, disciplined workforce, less industrial unrest. But increasingly, it's not about companies. It's about talent and about ideas. And talent and ideas are encapsulated in human minds. And the key then to economic survival is to create an environment, a living environment, which is compellingly attractive, which is safe, which is somewhere where you would stash your kids in. If I can get you to leave your kids with me and your wife or mistress with me, I know that you're going to spend more than half your time on a plane anyway. But this is home base. This is where your kids are. This is where they'll be educated. This is where your bank is. This is where some part of your value chain of your assets are going to be stashed. And I provide a home base for your headquarters as you explore Asia and indeed the rest of the globe. So I, 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 I say this because I want you to understand that this is not just a trite marketing campaign, but the vision that I've spelled out is one which we have carefully thought of, thought through, and intend to make it work because we need it for our own survival. And let me give you a few other examples of some quirks in our public policy. We don't believe in subsidizing consumption. So everything we consume, food, water, clothes, drugs, medication, everything is priced at the market, at the international market price. And why do we do this? Not because we are market fundamentalists, but because we know that in a resource-constrained world, getting the price right is essential. If you get the price right, then you send the correct signals 
for conservation, for efficiency, and equally important, to send the signals to investors who are willing to invest for the long term in the resource, in the factories, in the products, in the services that they're going to service and sell to the rest of the world. So getting the price right is important. Another aspect, transparency. As the world goes through these gut-wrenching changes, people are beginning to feel a sense of crisis. People want to know what's happening. And citizens will increasingly demand transparency, or even if governments don't provide it, it is now very easy for a citizen to produce his own meter to measure pollution in the air, to measure pollutants in the water. So rather than playing, having an antagonistic role, we might as well embrace the age of transparency and governments have to provide all the information which people have a right to know anyway. And the purpose of providing information goes beyond merely credibility of the government, but to enable people to make informed choices. What products are they going to purchase? What services do they want to utilize? Which is the most sustainable or safe or ethical way of consumption? Increasingly, we find, and especially in the younger generation, you know, it's sometimes ironic that younger people are more green conscious than the older generation. Perhaps it's because instinctively, Younger people understand that they have a bigger stake in a future, in an uncertain future, and therefore demand to know what is the true footprint of whatever product or service that is being produced or consumed. Another example is that we don't believe government alone can be the solution. On the other hand, getting policies wrong it's certainly a wonderful way, a very effective way to mess things up. But we also need academic research, development, and technology. But technology itself, if you think as far as the challenges we're going to face in climate change, you know, quite frankly, actually most of the technology that we need has been invented. The question then is, why has this not been implemented disseminated and rolled out. And that's because we really end up in a triangular no man's zone between governments on one hand, technology and its potential, and business interests. And climate change, unfortunately, is a perfect example of being trapped in no man's land of this triangle. You see, governments all over the world need to win elections. It's not that politicians are stupid, you know. Actually, most politicians, I dare say all politicians, actually know what's the right thing to do. But the difficult thing is to do the right thing and win the next election, which means all politicians, unfortunately, are very tempted to focus on the short term and to focus on the local. And even if you device optimal solutions. These are local optimizations rather than global optimizations. Nobody wins an election for saving the world. You might win an election for saving your district or your neighborhood. So this short-term myopic focus creates paralysis. On the other hand, businesses, the bottom line is your bottom line. You've got to make money or you're out of business. And if rules are not clear, if rules are not going to be consistently applied for the long term, you will not dare make the investments needed. You will not dare take the bets on the future, which are necessary if we're going to take the technology which is already available in order to solve a real world problem on a planetary scale. So, you know, I always find it very ironic. In the last two years, I've been engaged in climate change negotiations with Jose's sister. Um, and I can tell you, it's very ironic that the climate change negotiators have an enormous carbon footprint. We spend so much time traveling all over the world, generating lots and lots of hot air, but no solution in sight. It's, 
you know, you, you don't know whether to laugh or to cry about it. But somehow, we are going to need a breakthrough. My pessimistic view is that perhaps we're going to need a major global environmental disaster before voters wake up and demand action from their politicians to solve a global scale problem. You see, we all know about Hurricane Sandy, right? I don't know whether you were in New York when that happened. And in dealing with the impact of climate change, there are two dimensions to it. One is mitigation, and the other one is adaptation. Mitigation is how do we reduce carbon dioxide into the atmosphere so that there'll be less impact on all of us. Adaptation is when this place is underwater, how do we adapt? How do we continue to live and make a living? The ironic thing is that, yes, mitigation is going to cost us a lot because, quite frankly, it's still cheaper to scrape coal off the ground and to burn it than it is to invest in a solar panel or even in a windmill. I mean, we can argue about the curves coming together, but it's still cheaper to do the wrong thing. Right? And we make it worse, as someone just whispered down there, by subsidizing fossil fuels. If we can't even get the subsidies off the table, it's almost pointless talking about incentives to do the right thing. So we need to get our basics right. But coming back to this question of mitigation, yes, mitigation is going to cost us something. It's going to cost us quite a lot in the short term. But guess what? The cost of adapting to a climate damage world is going to be far off the scale of the cost of mitigation. But even then, because there is this short-term, local versus global and long-term problem, we still can't get our heads around it. We can't generate a political consensus for us to do the right thing. So it may be that we're going to need a major environmental disaster be before people wake up and force us to do the right thing. I hope I'm wrong. I hope that good sense will prevail, that good science will be believed, and goodwill and good faith will be, will be characteristics of our negotiating process. But anyway, watch this space and let's see whether we generate anything by 2015. Finally, let me just say a few words on energy efficiency. In Singapore, because we are so small, even if we were to put a solar panel on every rooftop, at ma maximum is we would generate maybe about 10 to 12 percent of our electricity needs. This is a safe place. There are no earthquakes and we're not sitting on top of a volcano, but it also means I can't get geothermal energy. This is also a very safe harbor. We don't have typhoons and hurricanes. You will also notice, therefore, it means I don't have much access to wind energy. So unfortunately, in the case of Singapore, 99% of my energy comes from fossil fuels, primarily natural gas. You notice I said 99% because the other 1% comes from incinerating all our garbage that produces 1% of our energy. And the reason we incinerated our garbage was not really primarily focused on energy. It was because we ran out of space for landfill. But anyway, that's another story. But the point I'm right making is that in the case of Singapore, energy efficiency is, at this point in time, the only game in town. We've given that every joule, every kilowatt hour is generated from imported energy. We have to conserve, we have to be as efficient as possible. And in the interest of time, I just want to, to give you some idea that in the areas of industry, in transport, in buildings, we have passed legislation and we have in place regulations to incentivize companies to pay attention to energy efficiency. We provide seed funding, we provide access to technology, and we make sure everyone, the big players, have a plan for energy efficiency, have to appoint someone who will take charge of that, generate those plans, submit the data to the government, allow peer review and benchmarking and cross-comparability. Um, 
These are areas which we are still working on, and I, I just put it to you that we need to focus on this in order to promote energy efficiency, because at this point in time, that's all that we can do as far as mitigation is concerned. For adaptation, we have to have long-term plans to deal with what we expect, anticipate to be sea level rises. So for instance, I said this was reclaimed land. It was set at the level of, at the, when we reclaimed land in the past, we said it has to be at least 1.25 meters above the highest recorded tide ever. Last year, we changed our regulations. We said, I think we better add another meter to that. Now that's going to be enormously expensive because it means we've got to add a lot more sand to build up platform levels. And some, of, some people will say, well, you're wasting a lot of money buying this extra sand. Well, I'll put it to you this way. I think this is it's called sand banking. If we don't need it, we'll have extra sand. We can put up more buildings. But if we do need it because the sea levels is rising, then we've bought ourselves some time. So the point I want to leave with you in Singapore is that we are trying to build a working model of the future. A future with a climate damage world, a future with many more people, a future where cities are the main game in town, and a future where energy, food, and water are interlinked, and a future filled with many crises, but therefore, by definition, many opportunities for many of you in this room. So I hope I've given you some food for thought and hopefully some sense both of crisis and opportunity and hope, perhaps. Thank you all very much for being here.